This is episode 51. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Today is a first, my first on location interview. Late last year, I dropped in and visited with the principals of the modern architecture firm Motative in Los Angeles. I encourage you to go check out the video because we have some great high definition video that we shot with a DSLR while we were down there, me and my cameraman. So go check it out and let me know what you think. These guys have been an inspiration to me ever since I started researching how to start a firm way back in 2006, which was when they founded their firm. Now, since then, Motative has been doing some very progressive designs in and around Santa Monica. And in this interview, I get the inside story on how they built a successful modern architecture practice that continues to grow year after year. Here's the show. Derek Levitt. I was uh, actually born and raised in Los Angeles. I feel like one of the few, but... Um, so we started the firm in 2006. We all graduated from USC and, um, you know, we all felt like there were different strengths and weaknesses between the three of us that we kind of made into a really good cohesive team. So, um, um, other than that, I mean, we have sort of really similar and yet diverse roles, I think within the office. So kind of let everyone else kind of say what they're, what awesome. they're, and what's, what what's, are. what's your role, Derek? You know, I I guess other than just general project management and um, I've sort of taken on a lot of the marketing side of the company um, and then I'm the licensed architect, so dealing a lot with the architecture side, although we all deal with that, but um, uh, project management, marketing, those kind of aspects, but I feel like all of us kind of have our fingers in just about everything. Gotcha. Okay, office. that's a little bit. Yeah. Hi, my name is Christian Navar, and uh, also went to the University of Southern California. Originally from uh, Sunnyvale, California, which is in basically the heart of Silicon Valley in Northern California. Um, I run mostly the operations in the business, so out of the three of us, I probably touch the day-to-day -day design work least now. Um, now that we have uh, built up our staff, I'm basically in charge of of that aspect of it, as well as most of the strategic planning in regards to tying in the, the de design the building process and then now our venture out into the development world okay. and right now how is your how is your client load or your project load as a firm uh, heavy yeah. really heavy I mean we're we're strapped big time I and mean, everybody's working a lot and thankfully we have a, a great staff who's mm -hmm. committed and are, are here I mean we're definitely not you know it's not a slave, slave labor type firm we're really big on organization and being efficient um, but nobody has uh, nobody sitting around with any downtime. Yeah, but you you just said you touched on company culture. Yeah, we talked a little bit earlier about the company culture about Fridays. Tell us a little bit about Fridays at the office. Give uh, us some give us some flavor. Well, I mean, Fridays is uh, is eighties Fridays. We're we're known for that. It's <laughs> technically <laughs> between nine and I'd say after lunch, and then we sort of turn three o'clock. We turn into more more club music, and <laughs> and uh, I'd say the the fridge opens up, and you know people grab some beers and some wine and kind of, you know, wind down the, the week. So, nice. um, you know, outside of that, I'd say that, you know, one of the things that we're really um, strong minded about is the business aspects of our firm. And so we really make it a point. How do you think that affects the firm? Um, at the end of the day, I think it's it's a positive thing, mostly because it allows the three of us to put our staff in a situation where they can talk with our clients on a one on one basis through the project, not just on a design level, but on what's most important to them, which is the business of, of development. Yeah. And what things do you do? You mentioned letting your staff talk with the clients. Are there any other things you do to nurture them in that entrepreneurial aspect? You know, most of the time they've been able to do it themselves. They, they took it upon themselves in their own education to sort of break away from that, you know, architecture world and the, their undergraduate or graduate um, education and splinter off into taking um, courses in, in business and development and we really reach out for people like that. So they, they usually come into us with a, a good mindset um, and then we try to nurture it from there. We, we definitely have what we call a sink or swim mentality here. Um, you come in and, and within week one you're presenting to our clients as if, if we were. So we really try to, to put people out there. To make and, them sweat. Yeah, make them sweat. <laughs> and and for the most part, they'll do a fantastic job. And it's, it, yeah, it makes yeah. it a lot easier on us. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that right now you're slammed with work. You have a lot of projects, very busy. How has that affected the firm 
Um, I'd say that our, our coffee intake's gone up significantly. Okay. I think our uh, our budget used to be about two hundred dollars a month. I think we're pushing three hundred a month now <laughs> just on coffee. Yeah. Um, at at the end of the day, I think people are really excited, um, yeah. especially coming out of such a slow period. Sure. Um, it's definitely taken some getting used to, and you know, if, if there's an extra added level of stress that comes with that. Mm -hmm. But I think at the end of the day, based on what we've just gone through. Um, it's a good thing, and, and people are happy to be a part of it. And then, how has that affected the finances of the firm in terms of vetting projects? Tell me a little bit about that. How that allows you to pick and choose projects, or what? How you deal with that overload of of prospects and leads? Well, um, it allows us to be in a position where we can definitely concentrate on on the future and our goals as a firm for a future by only selecting projects that sort of fit what we're trying to do as a firm. I mean, we really are working hard to be sort of a one-stop shop. We do have sort of a design build structure. Um, because the market's so good, we could um, pretty much, you know, demand that we're only going to take projects on where the client's going to allow us to build it. Um, and that's really what we're pushing for. You know, four or five years ago, that wasn't the case. You'd take just about anything. But we really want people to come to us who believe in the brand and believe what we can offer them. Um, and for us, that that's a seamless process from start to finish. Okay. Um, so we can be really selective about that now. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question. You can tell me who's best suited to answer this one. Maybe Derek. Yeah. Um, when you you know you want to push the construction side of the business. Yeah. How is that conversation when they come in for design services? How do you get them on board with the idea of you guys being involved in the construction? Yeah. I mean, the easiest way for sure is. I mean, this has been sort of the beauty of the arrangement we've had with being in this area, is. Uh, we've had two projects under construction that we were building over the last two years, about two blocks away from the office. So there's no better sales thing than to say at the end of a meeting in here, say, let's go take a little walk. You walk them over there. They see that we can actually do it. They like the product. And then it's a sales from there. So, I mean, that's a huge part of it. The other part is there's a lot of stories of what happens when you don't go that route, which is why we got into this to begin with the build side. Mm -hmm. um, we had plenty of projects um, some, I mean, some were fine, but there have been plenty of experiences, and I'm sure most architects have had it, where not a good contractor, everyone pays the price, the client, the architect, everyone, you know, that triangle of, of love and hate that sometimes happens in that relationship. So um, I think between sharing those stories and then at the end of the day, showing them what we can deliver by showing them the actual product and saying, if this is the product you want, the only way we can truly deliver this is if we handle the architecture side and the construction side, because otherwise there's just too much of a loss of communication. Yeah. What are the typical objections? Do you get any typical objections? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of times people are very set in this sort of traditional method of we have to bid it out. That's the way we're going to get the best price possible. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, what we tell them is that our goal is to work with them. So let's just be open and honest about everything. Tell us what your budget is. Tell us what you, you know, these are development projects for the most part. They have very set budgets or the pro forma doesn't work. What's the budget? And then we work to bid that out among subcontractors and negotiate among subcontractors to give them the best price. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, we are bidding it out. We're just the general. We're bidding it out to subs or we're negotiating with like our, our common subs that we use to get the price to where it needs to be. It's a very open process, very open book. We'll show them any bid they want to see. At the end of the day, there's no fluffing numbers. They know what our profit is. They know what our overhead number is in there. So it's a, it's a very different way of getting people to think, and they're not always open to that. But those that do, I think, really see the benefit of it pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Now, I'm just a general business question for you, Derek. Yeah. What would you say would be the number one, if you had to go back in time and try to figure out the number one thing that's led to your success, the success yeah. you're having now? Mm -hmm. I think for me, um, it would come down to having a good business sense. But I think more than that, it's been focus. Like we've constantly, once especially the market got better, we've been extremely focused on small lot subdivision in general. So, and while that seems like it's easy to do, it's actually very hard because as the market gets better, and your name gets out there more, people will come to you with all kinds of distractions. Do this commercial building, or could you do a condo for us, or a single family home, or this or that. And while sometimes that's good, by us staying focused and focusing on the fact that we want to start our construction wing and only build projects that we design, and just staying focused, 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 time and time again, I think has really helped. And then also saying no, saying no to bad clients, to bad projects, 
and staying focused on what we want to do as a firm. Okay. Now, you guys were also early adop adopters of uh, web tools yeah. and using, using HubSpot. Mm -hmm. How important was that to your current business? I think really critical. Um, what we saw in other other firms' websites at the time, and I know a lot of change since then, was uh, architects seemingly to design websites for other architects and for to showcase their work to other architects. Which what do you mean really... by that? Give me some insight. So, I mean, mostly design-driven. So, the website was all about, look at me, look at me, look how cool my designs are. I'm a great architect. And for us, that, that just seem like such a terrible approach because it wasn't really servicing your true client and what your client really cares about. Mm -hmm. And so tying that in with our focus, small lot subdivision, which was a new ordinance in LA started around the time we started our firm. Um, we saw our website more as a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. So how can we teach people, whether it's the basics of architecture, like how the architecture process works, or we can teach them really specifics. How does a small lot ordinance work? What can a developer do? What kind of lots do they need to look for to do this type of product? And we found that I think by being helpful instead of just showcasing what we do, um, it turned into a good thing. So there's always this fear of giving away information and are we giving away the farm with this? But at the end of the day, it really helped. It paid off. Yeah. yeah. And that's a good place to end this week's segment. Tune in next week for the rest of my conversation with Motative. <laughs> And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.